Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Welcome. My name is uh, Jesse Wiles. I'm a senior software developer here at Quadrilay Corporation for WebWorks, and uh, I'm filling in today for Ben Allums, the Director of Engineering. Today's Power Hour session is about ePublisher document processing. In particular, we're going to look at the uh, WebWorks interchange format, or WIF, as it's commonly known. First off, the agenda for today's Power Hour. First off, we're going to talk about some survey results that we sent out. Next, we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of what we're talking about today, which is understanding the ePublisher document processing workflow, and WIF in particular. And then lastly, we will end up with some webinars of interest. First off, the survey results. The first part of the survey was uh, a vote on when we should meet. You can see that 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock Central Time uh, tied, and so in August, the Power Hour will be held at 1 o'clock as it was held today. Next up, the survey asked which teleconferencing option would everyone prefer. You'll see that the landline won out narrowly over the voice over IP. Next part of the survey involved um, what are what is everyone's experience level. Um, and here you can see the results. And next, the topics to cover. You'll notice that DITA seems to be strong winner there. And lastly, we asked everyone to go ahead and give us some ideas, some topics you would like to see in upcoming Power Hours. Among the things that the feedback we received were um, CHM and WebWorks help, uh, how to handcraft CSS files, basically create your own CSS files to work or play nicely with the WebWorks auto-generated content. WebWorks help systems, how do we customize that? Things like skins and, and um, adding functionality and or just changing the appearance. Also other web-based help solutions. The Java help template. And then WebWorks help five customizations that involve multiple files. Okay, so these are all things that we'll, we'll look into when we decide what uh, next month's Power Hour session will be about. Now for the meat of what we're going to talk about today, which is understanding the uh, publisher document processing workflow, WIF files in particular. Topics we're going to address today. I broke these up into four main bullet points. Uh, these are distinct phases of the processing workflow. The all-important debugging flags, which can provide, uh, if you know about them and turn them on, they, it can provide a wealth of very valuable information to you. Uh, the data directory, understanding where the data directory is, um, something about the structure of the data directory, and all of the information that's available there. And lastly, the WIF XML structure itself. Um, so the other thing that I would like to get a handle on as we get started here is why are you here today? What are some of the things that you'd like to talk about? And, and I think I've muted everyone so that we uh, don't get a lot of interference. But if, you, if you'd like to go ahead and chime in on the chat, go ahead and tell me why you're here. And, and we'll, we'll try and incorporate some of the things uh, that you come up with in the presentation today. OK, so first step in our topics to address. Um, distinct phases of the ePublisher processing workflow. And I'm going to try something a little bit different here today. I'm going to go into this, uh, this drawing program that I really love on the internet. It's called Creately. And I'm basically going to draw the uh, distinct phases of the ePublisher workflow. And I'm going to ask for some help. Um, again, if you'd like to comment directly, uh, vocally, go ahead and uh, press star six, and you'll be able to into the teleconference, and then star six will again mute you within the, uh, within the conference. So the distinct phases, um, let's see. I've got these broken up into two main phases. 
Anybody want to take a stab at it? I'm going to call them, and this is just the ePublisher workflow in general. We'll call it scan, scan, scanning. and generating. Okay, thanks everyone for commenting in the chat. I'm noticing that we're getting a lot of good comments here. Um, scanning and generating. Anyone want to take a stab at what these uh, phases might involve? Okay. Scanning go ahead and tell you, involves styles. So this is how we uh, get uh, getting the style information from the source document. That source document would be your Word, FrameMaker, or data input. Next, how about, um, we'll call this one scanning conditions, okay? Any conditional text settings that you might have in your source document? And obviously, these are things that you can see within the ePublisher uh, project once you open it up. Um, obviously, one that's located really close here is going to be um, ref format. Variables. I guess technically I can put all these together. But I'm running out of real estate here. Mike says uh, we're reading the source, generating the width um, as, as the distinct phases. And, and, and mainly that's correct. Um, what, what are the other aspects of the scan? Um, I think an important one, uh, an important one that I haven't mentioned yet is, um, let's say, detecting a book file, file, right? So I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but when you import a uh, book file into the document manager, um, it asks to scan the the files. One thing it doesn't know yet is whether that's a book file or whether that is a an ordinary uh, FrameMaker file, and this is specific to FrameMaker. Uh, but you can also have the same thing in Word with uh, with the RD field, and basically any kind of container document, such as a, a FrameMaker book file or or um, uh, a Word file with the RD field, um, will allow you to refer to sort of constituent parts or or other um, files which might make it make up the um, make up the larger document. Uh, so a big part of the scan is seeing exactly what files are actually going to be imported. And after we after we scan, you'll see the book file in FrameMaker. In the instance of FrameMaker, you'll see the book file, and then beneath it, all of the individual FrameMaker files that make up that that document. Okay, what about the generating side of things? Um, two main phases here. Let's do it this way. Two main phases. And these are pretty low down in the in the in the details, but this is power hour and this is for power users. So uh we'll go ahead and, and won't be shy about it and we'll talk about what's there. Uh, the first of these we call duplicating. Spell that right? The original document. That's good, by the way, Melissa. Yeah, uh, um, the CSS is definitely an aspect of the generating portion. Um, basically, everything that doesn't, everything that happens, you can think of this this dividing line in the middle. Um, and actually, it might even be more useful if we do, if we make two of these. Uh, well, I think it might be useful. 
And then we say what happens in here, in this middle portion, is ePublisher Project Configuration. Okay, does that make sense? So on the left side, we scan documents into the project. On the right side, we're actually generating output, um, like Melissa said, the uh, CSS, obviously the HTML output, the image generation, stuff like that. Um, let's say all the um, output generation. All of this is happening after you click go, okay, or after you click generate or regenerate all. But here in the middle, this, this, this center portion, we would say, is everything that has to do with uh, changing CSS settings and the style designer, um, changing which, you know, what the conditions should be like for the project, changing what the variable values should be, um, changing what the target settings are, you know, what your headers and footers are going to say, things like this. Anything that you do within the ePublisher Pro interface uh, I'm kind of referring to here as ePublisher Project Configuration. And then you click Go, and you get the progress indicator. And during that, that's this phase over here. That's the phase on the right. We duplicate, and, and this, it's broken up into the parts of duplicating the original document, obviously generating the output files. But there's one important thing that happens in between those two parts. Uh, anyone on the chat, if you want to want to chime in can guess what this middle one is. I'll, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the, the topic <laughs> that we're uh, discussing today. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Width. Correct. Very nice. Uh, Namish, did I say it correctly? All right. Width. Web work per previous time. Okay. And that's it. So that's our distinct phases of uh, the ePublisher workflow. We start with the scan, we do the configuration in the middle, and then we generate. Let's go back to our presentation. Next up, debugging flag. Okay, so we took we went pretty high level conceptual deal here, down to a very low level um, aspect. I'm going to go ahead and open up um, Windows Explorer. And dig down into my WebWorks directory, because I want to show everyone the, what we refer to as the .config file. And for each of the, the three um, WebWorks executables, that is AutoMap Express or Pro, uh, next to the actual executable file that runs the program is a .config file, okay? Which is just the name of the executable file with the suffix .config. I'm gonna open that file up here to show it to everyone. Notice that it's just an XML file, and this file includes a lot of settings about um, you know where directories are and what you know what um, where the settings are, um, and and one of the nice aspects here, particularly for, for us from a development point of view, is you can sort of rearrange where the application looks for directories. It's also useful from a power user point of view for any of you that might be interested if you ever had a need to change where, uh, for example, the, the default application format directory path was, you can obviously, har or perhaps not obviously, but you can hard code a path then to a, um, a different, a completely different format path. The main, um, uh, Melissa wants to know what XML editor I'm using. This is called Komodo Edit. It is a free editor from the really smart people out in Vancouver at, a, at a Active State. Um, I like it a lot. 
Okay, at the bottom of the .config file, and this is in the Pro file, and, and I believe the Express is formatted pretty similarly, but you'll you want to go and uh, and open that up. Obviously, there are, or perhaps not obviously, but there are different settings in the Express uh, .config file that are shown here in the Pro .config file. But these should be common. These debug flags should be common. And you notice that I've gone ahead. Um, and set all of the values of these debugging flags to true. Now, for any of you that haven't opened this file up before and just have a standard ePublisher um, installation, these values are all going to be false. In order for these values to go live, you'll need to change this file, save the changes, and close and reopen ePublisher, because this file is only read once uh, when ePublisher is, is started up. Okay, So that's one thing to be aware of. Um, all right, easy enough. Next up, let's go back to our presentation. Data directory, the data directory gold mine. Anybody have uh, want to volunteer what they think this might be referring to? For any of you seasoned veterans. Okay, I'll go ahead and and. and and kill the suspense here uh, and open up my Power Hour project that we're going to be look, working with today and generate some output for it. So obviously, I've already uh, I've already added three documents, which means that we skipped the first distinct phase, the scanning phase. All of the settings. Um, I'm pretty much happy with, so I'm also skipping the ePublisher configuration stage, and we're going directly to the um, generation stage. Now, one thing you might notice as we're generating is that uh, there is a lot more debugging information than perhaps you're used to seeing in the ePublisher log. And that's because when you flip on those debug flags in the .config file, uh, one of the big things that we write is we tell you every time we wrote a file to disk and where we wrote it. Okay, You'll notice that these .exsl document uh entries in the log file are all pointing to a location here in user, zap data, local, blah, 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 big long path, right? Um, well, again, this particular aspect of the Power Hour is on the data directory gold mine, and these paths that are referred to are actually in the data directory. Okay, you'll notice, in fact, the part that I have highlighted here refers to a directory called data, uh, tucked uh, down deep in the um, in the temp directory of, of my local profile. Fortunately for us, we have a menu option that makes uh, navigating to this directory much easier than looking in the log. And that's available here in the view menu, data directory. Okay, And this will open a Windows Explorer instance that takes you directory, uh, excuse me, directly to the data directory for this particular project. One thing, I'll, I'll just take a slight, um, I'll deviate from the course slightly to go up a couple levels and just show you. This is kind of a shared um, directory for all of your ePublisher projects. But when you click that menu option, or when you select that menu option in ePublisher, view data directory, it will take you directly to the one, uh, to the data directory for the active project. Okay. Now, also, it's going to dump you out here at, at uh, what we call the top level of the data directory. I'm going to go back to my um, drawing program for a moment and create a new document. Okay. And I want to draw for you real quickly kind of the top down.
structure of the data directory. Okay, so and we'll call this data directory structure. And basically, this triangle. Uh, refers to the, the various scopes of the directories within the data directory. At the topmost level, we have files which whose scope is the uh, entire project. The information in these files is relevant to the entire project. Okay? Top level. And if this doesn't make sense yet, hang on, stay tuned. We're going to go ahead and, and, and look specifically at, at what this is referring to, but I'd like to go ahead and give you uh, a, a graphical representation of what's going on to, to sort of whet your appetite. Next step, the next level is a scope for only the group level files. Okay. And then finally, the last scope is the document level file. Okay, what's that referring to? Scopes and uh, this is the directory. Project. Entire project, yeah. Okay, let's go back real quick to the ePublisher user interface. You can think of the project as everything that's happening when I click Generate. Anytime I go into the Style Designer, I click on any of these options. I, uh, I look at the uh, various options that are available for, let's say, um, uh, headings. Are a common thing that we're going to... Um, word, frame maker, title, heading, interesting. Do I have any? Hey, no TOC. Um, so obviously one of the things that I'd want to do here is go in and map TOC entries. Okay. But anytime I, I'm in here, I'm in the center uh, phase of the distinct phases, the this, this center portion, I'm doing things that are related to the entire project, okay? Next part is you notice that each of each three of these uh, documents is under the umbrella of a group, what we call a group, and if you right-click, you'll notice that there is this um, idea or uh, label that we call a group, okay? So any, anything within this group, we say, is at this group. I can go and add a new group, completely new group. I can add new documents to it. add the same document. Oh, there was a scanning phase. Now I've got two different groups, okay? If we go back and we look at this uh, this pyramid of our directory structure, we'll call this thing scoping. Okay, the entire project is first. Next, we have group files, which seems to indicate that we should see at least two directories in our data area for each of the two groups that I've created, right? We go back and we look in our data directory. Up top, we have things that are at the project level. Also, please note that within the data directory, we'll kind of hint the scope with a suffix. 
Um, in this case, the fi each, many of the file names have this underscore project suffix. Uh, that, that means And, and Mike's asking a question here about, um, I think he's trying to make it, uh, Mike, I believe you're trying to make a distinction between ePublisher Pro and Automap, but actually Automap just runs uh, projects just like Express and ePublisher Pro. Um, Alan, you're saying, where does the project cache um, fit into your diagram? Uh, the project cache is mo mostly for UI elements. Um, things like wh when I modify my conditions or my conditional expressions and I need to update the, the user interface to, to, um, to reflect what some of those changes are. Um, it's not specific to the project itself. And the project generation phase doesn't rely on anything in the project cache. Oh, I see, Mike. Okay. Um, so here we are at the top level. Next, we said we're going to go down in scope to our um, to our group level. Okay, you'll notice that a lot of the suffixes here have the underscore group uh, to sort of specify. Okay, and also I'm I'm only seeing one group here. How come? Well, we never generated with our new group. If I go ahead and generate all. Now that I've added a new group, we should see a brand new file show up in our data, or sorry, new directory show up in our data area to, to reflect the new group that we have. And there it is, okay? So again, this is the first level. This is our project scope. Now we have two group level scopes, okay? And then by intuition, I'm sure each of you can, can uh, determine what each of these final directories within each group must indicate. These are the documents, the document level items within the group. Okay? And here, nestled down in the very furthest uh, level of the structure of a data directory, we find a, uh, a file with the extension dot with. And, and finally here at last, halfway through Power Hour, we're to the actual with itself, okay? So nestled way down deep in the data directory, within the project level, within the group level, and then within the document level folders is the actual dot with itself. One thing I'd like to highlight while we're, while we're kind of talking about the data directory, is that there, once you turn on those debugging flags, particularly for, and Nadine, I see that you're in the, in the conference, for folks that are, that are interested in DITA and, and really working with some of the configuration with DITA, the debugging flags, when you turn on the, the debugging for DITA, you notice that we write a whole lot of extra files. And these extra files have to do with the conversion from the original um, DITA map and pre-processed data map to the, the WIF results. So these files can be invaluable to, to kind of determining what you need to do in your, in your default www.config configuration to uh, get the result that you're looking for. Um, you'll notice in FrameMaker, a couple things I'd like to highlight. We have uh, MIF versions of the source document, okay? that are also included, we call these PMIF and NMIF. Again, these files will only show up if you have those debugging flags and the dot config set to true, okay? And then Word is fairly straightforward. It just has the, um, the dot .wif file. Now, I will say also, one thing I wanna highlight, uh, here in the data directory before we actually get into the final aspect or the final, the main part of, of the, or, or sort of the wrapping up portion here, is uh, this, in this case it's a docx with, but you'll notice in FrameMaker it's a um, .fm with, and in DITA it's a 
map with, okay? Whatever the name of the source file was, the original source file, okay? You take that name and you just put the letters WIF on the end. That file is the duplicated original document, okay? That was a little quick, so I'll go back and say it again. In the, in the way down in the dregs of your data directory, down where the WIF, where the WIF grows, way down deep where the WIF grows, is, um, a, is a file, which is the, origi the name of the original document with just the letters WIF on the end of it. And this file is the duplicated source document itself, an FM WIF, a DOCX WIF. Okay, and just to highlight that again, in the distinct phases that we represented here, the first thing that we do when we're generating is we duplicate the original document. Why do we do that? Um, we duplicate the original document so that we can apply conditions, so that we can apply different cross-reference formats, so that we can essentially mess it up. We can take all of your settings that you applied in the ePublisher project, we create a brand new copy of the original document, and we do all sorts of terrible stuff to it. But your original source document never sees any of those changes. It remains pristine, and, and only the, the um, copy that we keep way down deep here in the, in the deep, deep, deep in the data directory is the one where all of these changes um, get applied. Nadine is asking, uh, Jesse, you have to set those flags to true each time you upgrade. Yes, you do. Um, we don't, when you uninstall, that dot config file will get cleaned up, and then when you install the new uh, upgrade, the new dot config will have the default false values, uh, uh, so you'll need to go in and set those values to true. Okay. Uh, let's hopscotch back real quick to my PowerPoint, power -y PowerPoint. We get to our final uh, topic to address, which is the structure of the XML document itself. Let's crack some of these guys open. So we'll hop back over to the data directory and look at the, we'll open up each of these. Komodo's just complaining that I opened a really big WIF file, um, and it doesn't want to give me text highlighting. But I'll say, you know what, Komodo, I believe you can do it. I believe you can do it. Go ahead and give me some text highlighting. Uh, so that's the one for the Word document in our project. And we've got a FrameMaker document in our project. And let's go ahead and open up its WIF. Guy. And lastly, we'll open up the data with. Okay. Um, so, but what is the structure? What does the structure look like of a WIF file? Simply put, two main parts. Just very analogous to, to HTML or, um, yeah, I guess, mainly HTML. Uh, although I, I would say that the head area in an HTML document is mostly reserved for, in my mind, it kind of mirrors uh, uh, HTTP in general, which is comprised of, first off, some headers, and second off, an actual body. And I feel like HTML... Uh, does the same thing. We also have a uh, structure which has two main parts. The content is kind of like our body. The, uh, lar the style portion, though, doesn't really have anything to do with headers, but this is just sort of the catalog information. Melissa, you had talked about CSS files that we generate, um, the external CSS files that we generate. 
this information is taken almost exclusively from the styles uh, area and any any overrides that you have made in your project. Okay. So uh, that's the basic structure. We start with a top-level document element. We have a styles element and a content element within it. Let's crack open the styles element. For the styles, we have, as you can probably imagine, and what basically mirrors what you see in the ePublisher style designer, um, style sections for most of the constituent parts of the style designer. Paragraph styles, character styles, table styles, and graphic styles. Um, not no marker styles show up in our styles area. Anybody have a guess as to why that might be? Uh, feel free to comment on the chat. Oh, Mike's asking a question. Is it a true copy of the source, or does it include only what ePublisher cares about? It not only Mike, not only is it a true copy of the source, but it is a a file save as copy. It's not like a file system control X control V copy. It is a um, we're talking in the case of FrameMaker and in the case of Word via ActiveX or via DDE to the actual application itself, Word or FrameMaker, and we're asking those applications to save the original document as the document down in the data. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, Okay, so just to, to step back real quick, the reason we don't have marker styles, I didn't hear anybody volunteering or see anybody volunteering, the reason we don't have marker styles is there's not really any style information for markers. Now, that's a little bit different than, than what we used to do with WebWorks uh, Publisher before the ePublisher paradigm. Uh, markers have moved over into a, a different way of thinking about. We basically map markers to behaviors. And, and we don't really think of them in the same way that we think of styles, which are essentially uh, formatting information or, or uh, aesthetic information. Okay, What's in the styles block of the WIF file is pretty much limited to things that, that you can find in CSS. And we'll see that as I kind of crack open some of these items. So here we are in the frame maker with in the paragraph styles, and you'll notice that there are paragraph style blocks for each of the um, style types that came out of the original frame maker document. And these, they're obviously frame, or maybe not obviously, but frame maker does include other options that, in many cases, are specific to frame maker. Uh, the ePublisher with reduces the uh, information or sort of normalizes the information to a set of agreed upon uh, styles. Basically, if it's in the CSS2 standard, then we're going to accept it in the style portion here. Okay, um, and the and this is the same for for each of the input type of documents that I have here. Oh, and look, did it just made a liar out of me. Uh, it, it did and it didn't. One thing that you'll notice here is that even though uh, did it includes marker styles, it doesn't, um, you'll notice that there there isn't actually any CSS type of information associated with any of these marker styles. And the main reason that these things show up as marker styles within a DITA with is because DITA unlike FrameMaker and Word, has the added task of taking data structure and compressing or flattening that into WIF or, or the way that WIF understands the world, which is, is largely based on the way that FrameMaker and Word see the world, and, and, and similar applications like OpenOffice. Um, okay, so that's what you're going to find in the style section. Uh, you can probably intuit that the final section, the content section, is where you'll actually find your data. Um, the content section is comprised of the three main elements, paragraphs, tables, and frames. Okay? Uh, and within those, you'll, you'll find what we call text runs, which are basically just runs of text or, or ranges of text 
uh, let's say, between character style instances or between, in the case of Word files, where uh, we, we limit, try and limit the length of a line. Um, as you'll see in the region that I've highlighted here, try to we try not to write too much information into the value att attribute of a text element here, uh, but we try and break those up so that uh, for a number of reasons, but one is so that it's easier to look at, easier to read. Um, uh, here we have an instance of a table within the word table has a very similar type of layout to HTML tables uh, or, or data tables or and, and similarly paragraphs are very similar to let's say HTML P's or data P's. Um, text runs are analogous to spans and, the, and these um, are things that you'll see reflected in the output. For example, um, Character styles with any publisher. And let's see if we have a character style instance here. It's not jo jumping out at me. Uh, but let's go in and add one real quick. To, uh, to demonstrate how this works. So in Word, I'm going to go ahead and add a character style. We're going to take the word dangers and we're going to apply uh, what kind of style can we apply to that? Let's see. Let's get this one. Okay. Save that. Regenerate. Okay. Notice that we're updating the documents, we're preparing the documents. Anytime you see it say applying settings, that's the duplicating the document portion. And anytime you see the preparing, that's the actually generating the WIF. And then the generating output is that final phase that we looked at, the distinct phases. Now if I go back into my uh, Komodo, look at this WIF file, it should have automatically updated. And what's the name? I'm looking for the word dangers. Okay. Reason that file didn't update. Let me regenerate all. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out here is that when you um, regenerate all in ePublisher, it will go ahead and wipe out all of the files in your data directory, which will force all of the files to be generated again. And that's distinct from the generate all, which is which is a little bit of a more speculative um, uh, incremental build, meaning that we won't redo work that we've already done if we don't need to. If if the source file hasn't changed on disk, we won't regenerate a WIF for it. We'll leave the existing WIF, and any of the files that were generated. As a result of that WIF, if they if the WIF hasn't changed and those files have no reason to change, then we won't do that work again. Um, okay, so let me go back and look here at my WIF. For believe that that's really the case. I'm not seeing that as a character style. And I'm not going to let this grind, grind us down to a halt here, but I'm going to take uh, just a brief moment to try and get this guy to uh, okay. Close. 
Okay, so one of the great implications that we have here of, of all of the e-publisher inputs, this, in the case of this project, we have data framemaker and Word all going to WIF files. Because these WIF files are all the same, they're basically the same. They have the same structure. We pull the same information out of the source documents, and we essentially normalize them into, um, into, into our intermediate format. Part of the great power of that is that we can take disparate input sources and create a unified look and feel on the other side, and that's what, uh, that's what we're demonstrating here in this project. Go back into my word whip. I don't believe it's telling me the truth, but I'll look at it. All right. Anyway, there's something funky going on there that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stop and, and figure out what it is. Uh, anyway, we've looked at the content. We've lo we've looked at the styles region. We've looked at the content region. Uh, let's see if we can look real quick at an example of a frame. We looked at uh, examples of table elements. Here we have an instance of a of a, of a frame. Frames are basically um, anchored frames from FrameMaker or drawings or, or imported graphics from Word, uh, ex, uh, images from Dita, and th this is how they're represented in the WIF file. Okay. Um, okay. So, does anyone have any questions about? I think this is one of the great untapped powers of e ePublisher. Um, obviously, we provide sort of easy button formats, but the fact that as as a matter of course, that ePublisher normalizes all of these inputs to a, a single consistent XML format means that you can use any you can use uh, your own processing on those XML files. Those XML files can be used by anything. To make any kind of changes, Melissa asks, uh, "If any change in the WIF, if anything changes in the WIF, will it change in the output? If I, if you make a change in the WIF, will it uh, change in the output when you regenerate? WIFs are generated each time. They're generated based on whether or not the source document has changed, or whether or not you clicked regenerate all." Or whether you've deleted, uh, let's say, gone in and manually deleted some of the uh, data directory files. However, you, you, of course, you're welcome to to pull those out to make copies of them. Uh, one very effective way to kind of see what changes in a document is to make just to make copies or backups of those WIF files and then do diff against various versions of the WIF that come out in the data directory. Okay, so we're, we're winding up here. Last thing on the agenda was to highlight some webinars of interest. Um, on the 18th, coming up on the 18th, we have Show Me. And Show Me uh, is a little less down in the details than this Power Hour session is. It's, uh, as the name suggests, showing what's possible with ePublisher. This is a webinar that we repeat on the third Thursday of every month. And listed here at the bottom of the slide uh, is the sign up for Show Me. And then I host a study hall session um, on the second and last Wednesday of every month. It's really informal and, and the whole point is if, you, if you've got something really cool that you want to do or you've got something that's a little bit off in, in the weeds or off in the, the unsupported <laughs> um, aspects of ePublisher, that's what we look at during study hall. The idea being that you, know, you, you kind of take some of your special projects into study hall and you get a chance to work with an expert on, on uh, realizing those projects. 
Um, there is no sign-up to show up. It's available on a first-come, first-served basis. So get there early. Um, I try and make sure that we talk to everybody that shows up. And, and in some cases, I'm not able to give a full solution. But, but we should be able to at least talk about or, or, or help push the, the rock up the hill a little bit on, on any projects that you bring into study hall. Okay, and that's it for our Power Hour session today. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up today. Looks like we have one person typing. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for showing up today. I um, was really happy that I had a chance to talk to all of you about ePublisher, something that I'm very passionate about. And uh, come back. Please come back and see us at Study Hall. Show me. And thank you very much.